GAs fallen. That's all we need. Hello. Oh, it works. Awesome. Okay, let's see that we get things working. Do you see something? Okay, so live in three dimensions, the man behind all the OpenGL blog posts in Qt Block, Laszlo Agos. Let's hear it for Laszlo. <laughs> all right, yes. go ahead. Um, thank you. And the name is Laszlo Agos, correctly, but yeah, never mind. Yes, I'm losing my voice, but nonetheless, I'm talking so much. <clears throat> Nonetheless, I'm still a slow coach. I'm doing all sorts of OpenGL and embedded Linux and, you know, other things in Qt. You know, in a wide variety of platforms. And, you know, lately I've been also looking at some 3D related stuff. So, who's doing 3D stuff here? Raise your hands. Well, okay, that's not that many. Yeah, it seems that people are more into CIs and all the testing stuff, which is a bit sad, but nonetheless, who's and who has tried or is planning to try Qt3D? Oh, that's actually more, which is weird, but awesome. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, so, and this is a talk about loading assets efficiently with Qt3D. Because, you know, as you will see, there are some challenges with that. Well, I had some slides, but they are not that exciting, so I just, you know, write stuff here. So, say you are doing this because you want to load something. You, you received a model from somewhere, like, say, a model of a car from, you know, your design department sent you the model, and you want to put it into your Qt3D application and you write something like that. Hopefully it's visible. So you use the mesh element. So there are three things that are wrong with this code. Well, or two, okay, it depends on the use case. So first of all, it doesn't work <laughs> because, you know, the, me the mesh element does not support uh, pretty much any 3D model formats, except for the good old Wavefront OBJ. So obviously this wouldn't really work. Now, second problem, and you know, this isn't really a problem, it's a feature, but we you know most people run into this, that the mesh element loads geometry. So you will get a you know, single mesh. There's no material, so say you have a texture defined, it just won't be there. And finally, the third problem is the performance. Because, you know, say your car model is 40 megabytes, it's full of text, you know, it's text, like floating point numbers in OBJ, and that's slow to load, especially on embedded devices. So, second try, you use this scene loader, which kind of solves the second problem, because now you have the material and all the sub the named sub -meshes, you know, potentially other stuff, say lights, camera, depending on the format, maybe animations loaded. But, you know, this is, uh, ah yes, this is actually based on Asimp, because now we use an external framework, and we support a wide variety of, of formats, not just OBJ. But the performance issue is still there, because, you know, it will still be slow. And that's why, you know, at some point in summer, we, you know, added some new stuff to Qt3D, which is based on GLTF, which is an upcoming Kronos endorsed its format. It's still a work in progress. So this is a runtime asset format, and it's extremely cool for Qt usage because one, you know, the scene is, is described in JSON, and two, all the geometry and whatnot, that's, you know, just a single binary blob, which is fast to load, even of low-powered embedded devices, which are I.O. bound. Not to mention the fact that if we are using Qt, we could even, you know, use Qt's own binary JSON format, which is even faster to load, so we can optimize even that. And so, what we did is that, of course, on one hand, we enhanced, or basically, basically made, Q3D's GLTF uh, 
scene loader plugin work, so we updated it to match the current GLTF specification, which is one thing. And in addition to that, we introduced some tools. So I'm gonna use this example application, which is called Black Snail. I didn't write it, and I have no idea why it's called Black Snail, but nonetheless. You can now do this. So, the awesome thing here is that I listed my Collada models in this models list, and then I will rely on this QGLTF tool at build time to convert all these, all these models into GLTF, and what's more, I will get them pegged into compressed Q3 source files which is awesome because, you know, that's what we want, uh, like a single compressed resource file containing the JSON, the geometry, the textures, the shaders, and whatnot. And, you know, what's more, that this also gets deployed automatically, so say you are targeting an embedded device, then, you know, you press run, and together with the executable, all the stuff gets deployed automatically. Well, as long as you are using Qt4 device creation, which you should. Yes. Plus, we have a number of other interesting features because, you know, plain GLTF is targeting WebGL, so that's not ideal if you are after core profiles. So we have some slight extensions to the format, you know, so that to make it really more compatible with Qt3D. And basically that was it because... Uh, let's clean this thing and rebuild. And as you can see, there was plenty of soft stuff printed there, so that was the conversion step. Yes. So, and we generated this QRB files. files. Oh, man. Well, yes, and the application still works. You know, we, we have two models here. One is this famous Sony Duck. The other one is our custom damaged cube which is awesome because it has two textures. There's a bump map there so that we can, just to show that we can use two textures. Anyway, and you know, from the application's point of view, there's no difference because, the, you know, like say the duck is still loaded the same way. It's all transparent. It's just much faster. So this now starts up kind of instantly, even on an embedded device unless the original where we, yeah? That's small, very nice. Unless the original version where, you know, we just simply spend more time on, on the I.O. and then parsing the stuff. Yes, so basically that's all. Maybe it's worth mentioning that there are, you know, some secret features. So for example, we've been also experimenting with compressed textures because those of you who are after, say, you know, embedded or mobile targets, we'll often want to use compressed textures. And, you know, having such a tool in the pipeline is great because now we can, if needed, like say, convert all the textures, the compressed ones, during build time, and then deploy only those to the device. So, you know, not to mention the fact that, of course, we could do all sorts of other optimization steps in the future if, if you know, if there's a need for that. Yes, anyway, so that's all. So this is currently uh, part of the Q3D repo. It needs some extra steps because, like I said, this is a tool and the corresponding QMake rules, so it needs some manual steps to get that installed, like running make install in the correct place. But once that's in place, applications can do just like this example here. You know, simply specify the models in their pro, the project files, and then, you know, just continue, use the scene loader element normally. So, yeah, I think that's all. All right, thank you, Laszlo. Okay. Okay, Frederick is borrowing someone else's.